Well, welcome everyone. I'm so pleased to be talking with WCT's long-standing friend, Peter Smith. And, and Peter, you have just a fascinating background that you were uh, president, the inaugural president, uh, not just president, but the inaugural president for both the community college and a university. Uh, you've been elected a state senator, a congressman, a lieutenant governor. You were served as the assistant director general for education at UNESCO, and I think you were in Paris at that time. Currently, you hold the Orkin Endowed Chair uh, and that you're a professor of innovative practice, practices at UMGC, University of Maryland uh, Global Campus. And so you've quite the career and seen uh, quite a few things through the years. Uh, and then most importantly, yeah, that you were on our uh, WCT's Executive Council during transition times, and you were very helpful in uh, advising us through this time. And so uh, welcome, Peter. Well, it's great to be with you, Russ, and I am indeed um, um, Somebody once introduced me as a man with a great future behind him. Uh, <laughs> but I, um, part of the part of that great uh, great future was my work with WCET. I just love the organization. I love the people. I love the purpose, and um, remember it very, very positively. Thank you, thank you. Well, you 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 really helped us through, and we uh, appreciate that to this day. And so. Uh, with that, what we're here to talk about is that you're up to, this is your fifth book, is that right? That's <laughs> it, yes. Your fifth book, well, very good, okay. And uh, the book is Stories from the Education Underground. Uh, it's a great title, uh, I really like that. And uh, in this book, Peter shares uh, interviews with uh, at least uh, 20 different adults. And in these interviews that he's uh, asking some uncomfortable questions and revealing some uncomfortable truths about uh, higher education that uh, uh, he's reflected on and that there's you know, sort of new revelations that you have in this that came out of the uh, uh, interviews that you have and some of the things that you look, uh, looked at was about you know the social justice uh, and those sorts of uh, issues within uh, higher education and how the systems of higher education and how we're set up don't always uh, lead to that and lead to uh, uh, equitable outcomes for everyone. Uh, and the second one is about knowledge discrimination, is that, that really we value what's taught in the classroom. Anything that happens outside is that, well, there's a few places that might do something with that, but we're not really uh, uh, not really valuing that, you know, people come with, uh, with a lot of knowledge and a lot of skills when we get there. So, um, Peter, uh, so glad and, and thank you for writing the book. Well, you're, <laughs> you're welcome. And it was this one. Well, always writing books is interesting, but this was a real learning journey for me because it happened during the pandemic, which I hadn't planned on, but interviewing these people. And I think for many of us, you know, most of us, the pandemic slowed us down and things that we knew about up here began to become painfully obvious in terms of people's insecurities, the insecurities of frontline workers of all types and professions and, and occupations. and. So there was more time to actually reflect on what I was hearing uh, in, a, in, a, in a heartfelt way than um, purely a, an intellectual way. And what I came to uh, in terms of your first observation was two, two things. I mean, as, as magnificent as the system of higher education is that we've constructed in this country since the GI Bill, I'll start it there. I know there's history before that. Um, it is, and it is a miracle. And nobody else has tried to do what we've done, but it works for, on a good day, about a third of the people who might want to use it or be able to use it. And by age and income, that's a, that's a fairly rarefied group. And so the whole question of whether or not we're going to get the next third, uh, I'm just to use a number of qualified people being served so that their learning and their work and their lives are integrated in a way that's good for them. That's, I think, a huge question. And that's what came to me as I was interviewing people and thinking about it. And I think the, the whole, the notion of social justice is not only that we need them, but our mythology says that if people don't succeed at higher education, let's say, that they lack grit or they're, they don't have what it takes or uh, that, you know, they're, they're not as intelligent as they need to be, but it's their fault. At the end of the day, oh, it's yeah. on them. And what I came to understand... It's sort of the, def it, the deficit thinking in that, right? You know, that exactly. Yeah, and, right. and I've known this for a long time, but it came through loud and clear to me in these interviews. Um, 
Yes, it hurts them, but it hurts the whole society because we are robbed of their talent and their ability to make contributions um, uh, in so many cases. And the people I talked to were the winners. These are people who overcame enormous uh, obstacles in most cases to finally make get where they they wanted to go. Uh, okay. And that gets at the third point, which is that the basis for this is undervaluing, denying, you know, and or flat out discriminating against the knowledge that people create away from school. And as long as we ignore that, what we're doing is frankly disrespecting culture, life experience, real talent, intelligence, and it's and there's all this talent walking around every day that we're ignoring. And it wasn't the people I wrote about, it's all the people they represent who who don't get the breaks that they get at some point during their lives, sometimes after 35 or 40 years of trying. Um, and we just got to do a better job. And that's the social justice. It all adds up to a social justice issue, which will make America a stronger place, socially, civically, economically.